So, in 2 Samuel, Ahithophel's advice to Absalom is, kill the king now. He's weak. He's on the run. You've already demonstrated publicly how you despise him and the contempt you have for him by sleeping with his concubines on the roof. Go after him. Catch him. Do what Saul never did. Catch him and crush him. Once you do that, his followers will return to you because what choice will they have? That's Ahithophel's advice. Maybe that gives you some sense of the psalm that we're reading today. Now, this psalm was not necessarily written in response to this particular situation. It could have been written by David when he was still fleeing from Saul. Either way, David has experienced enough persecution and suffering in his life that his psalms make sense. A song of ascents of David. This would be sung while uh, ascending the steps at the temple. Had not the Lord been with us, let Israel say, had not the Lord been with us, when people rose against us, then they would have swallowed us alive, for their fury blazed against us, etc. David is not writing fiction. In the Psalms that David wrote, he knows whereof he speaks. He's writing from this experience. He's writing because he's living by the skin of his teeth, both as a young man chased by Saul and as an old man chased by his own son. In both cases, he can only rely upon the Lord. But notice how God, as this story plays out, does not intervene directly with miracles. See what happens as the story plays out in the next few days, how in fact the psalm that David writes Had the Lord, had not the Lord been with us when the people rose against us, they would have swallowed us alive for their fury blazed against us. We get to see how the Lord is with David, not by any miraculous intervention on the part of God, but by the way the natural events play themselves out, which is how God typically works. Blessed Dominic Barberi, whom I portrayed in a one man show, in his heart, He was Italian, but he wanted to go to England, this is back in the 19th century, to evangelize the English people and to try to bring them back into the Catholic faith. But he never said anything. He had a vision in prayer that this would happen to him, and he never said anything. But eventually it came to pass through a series of very strange coincidences among his superiors and his order. He was a passionist and so forth. Sometimes God works in mysterious ways through non-mysterious or ordinary means. Let's take a look at what's going on in Jeremiah. God is angry at his own priests, the Jewish priests in this case. Hmm, I wonder if he ever gets angry at our Catholic priests. Hmm. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the flock of my pasture, oracle of the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, against the shepherds who shepherd my people, you have scattered my sheep and driven them away. They've been anti-shepherds. Shepherds are supposed to keep the sheep together and protected. They've driven them off actively. They've done just the opposite. You have not cared for them, but I will take care to punish your evil deeds. Now, I don't know the original Hebrew here, but at least in English, there's a pun on the word care. You're supposed to care for your people. Well, I'll take care. I'll take care to scatter you the way you've scattered my people. I'll take that care. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock from all the lands. Now here, though, God is functioning as an actual shepherd. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock from all the lands to which I have banished them and bring them back to their folds. There they shall be fruitful and multiply. Now remember, he has been telling Jeremiah to prophesy of the coming invasion by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and how Jerusalem will be destroyed and its inhabitants carried off to the north country, meaning Babylon. But here he's saying, I will be a true shepherd unlike you. I will shepherd my people back to the promised land. 
I will bring back a remnant, a remainder of the people who have sinned and are being punished. I will raise up shepherds for them who will shepherd them so that they need no longer fear or be terrified. None shall be missing, oracle of the Lord. And again, he says he's going to do this through natural means. He will not appear in the sky. We're going to get into the book of Revelations and all the strange vision and the strange symbolism. It's not a miraculous apparition of God as the great shepherd or of Jesus as the great shepherd. He will provide them human shepherds who will help lead them back and spiritually will guide them in the way that their current priests and shepherds are failing to do. And then he says this, See, the days are coming, oracle of the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous branch for David. As king he shall reign and govern wisely. He shall do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell in security. This is the name to be given him, the Lord our justice. I will raise up a son of David. Even though the kingly line of David, the dynasty, in Judah, the southern kingdom, is about to be fractured because when they're taken into captivity by the Babylonians, they no longer have their own king. There is a kind of set of acantists, you might say. Uh, the seat of kingship is vacant in Jerusalem for many, many years, decades. And yet, God promises to restore this dynasty with a branch of David, meaning one of David's sons will eventually reign again over Jerusalem, and he will be called the Lord of Justice. Who do you suppose that's going to be? Remember, this was spoken to Jeremiah and written down in the um, 6th century B.C., and I believe the 580s B.C., and it's clearly a prophecy of Christ, the son of David. And then at the end here, he unveils, he, he unveils against the false prophets, people he did not send. They say to those who despise the word of the Lord, peace shall be yours, and to everyone who walks in hardness of heart, no evil shall overcome you. This is part of what bad shepherds do, and bad teachers, and bad parents, and bad politicians, and bad judges. They don't have the courage to say, knock it off. If you keep acting like this, you're in danger. The people have a hardness of heart. The people are worshiping the false gods. And the prophets, the false prophets, don't say, you will be punished. You're in danger. You're destroying your covenantal relationship with our creator. The false prophets say, don't worry about it. Everything's all right. It's all good. There's peace. Peace, brother. Peace is the most important thing. Just relax. Everything's fine. I mean, does this stuff sound familiar? This stuff from 16, 2,600 years ago? Does it sound familiar? Now, I have to give you at least a little introduction to Revelations. This won't be easy, kids. Revelations is kind of Another epistle of St. John. We've read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, his first three letters or epistles. This is written in the form of another letter. John to the seven churches in Asia. Well, what are the seven churches in Asia? He enumerates them and lists them later. Asia would have been a province of the Roman Empire back in the day. This is written toward the end of the first century. We under, we, the tradition is that St. John died around the year 100. He was the last of the apostles to die, and he was the youngest of the apostles. This is written around the year 100. The seven churches of, of Asia are the churches in the province of Asia in the Roman Empire, what we today would call Turkey or Asia Minor. So this letter or epistle or warning or prophecy is delivered to those seven churches in particular, but the number seven... Number seven in uh, Jewish numerology and in ancient the ancient world in general, especially in the Jewish world, was considered a number that represented fullness. This is why there are six plus one days of creation, six days of creation and a seventh, which is a Sabbath. Seven was the complete number of the creation of, of everything, and it represented wholeness. So in writing to the seven churches, of Asia, Asia Minor, Turkey, 
John is not just writing to those particular seven churches. He is symbolically writing to all the churches, meaning all the church and every individual um, sub um, um, division of the one church. I, and then here's the first vision. I, John, your brother, who share with you the distress, because the Christians were being persecuted, the kingdom, which is not yet fully come, and the endurance or patience in this life we have in Jesus found myself on the island called Patmos because I proclaimed God's word and gave testimony to Jesus. What is Patmos? It was a penal colony. Apparently, John has been imprisoned for being a Christian and is, has seen these visions on Patmos, and he's now writing what he has seen to the church as a whole. I was caught up in spirit on the Lord's Day, meaning Sunday. Caught up in spirit means he experienced an ecstasy or a trance or perhaps physically was taken somewhere else and heard behind me a voice as, a, as loud as a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those are the seven churches in Turkey or Asia Minor that he's writing to. And in the next chapter, he begins to address each church individually and in particular. This is what he is told to write by this, by this character. Who's this character? He turns, and who is it? Well, his feet were like polished brass refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Now, the Roman emperors were often depicted in this way, but to hold seven stars symbolically means you control the wholeness of the universe. A sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, and his face shone like the sun at its brightest. And he says, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, meaning Alpha and Omega. That's what those were the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I am the one who lives once I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death and the nether world. Write down, therefore, what you have seen and what is happening, and what will happen afterwards. Write what you have seen, what is happening, and what will happen afterwards. Write the content of your vision. Write what is currently happening and what will happen afterwards. There is prophecy in this book, but the prophecy even here is connected to what is currently happening in John's day in first century, the first century Mediterranean world, which is controlled by the Roman Empire. So that sets the stage for what's about to come. But I'm going to hold your hand and guide you through it, because Revelations is a little strange. Finally, I know this has been a long video, but what the heck? What else are you going to do today? Have fun? No, you're going to watch this all day. I told you that this is, this is the parable that describes how people reacted to the true prophets, how we react to true prophets today, and how the Jews reacted then. The owner of the vineyard keeps sending people to these um, stewards who are in charge of what he's given them, and they beat them up, and they kick them out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let us kill him. The inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Well, who's the son of God? That parable clearly means Jesus. God keeps sending his people prophets. They keep beating up, imprisoning, and torturing the prophets. And they continue to do that with the apostles to follow. What do they do to Jesus? They say, this is, this is his son. If we kill him, we can make a claim on the inheritance of this estate. In other words, if we kill God, we human beings, then it's no longer God's creation. It's ours. And we can do with it what we want. That satanic motivation is at the heart of all of our sin from the Garden of Eden onward, when the snake tells Eve, eat the apple and you shall be like gods. Kill the Son of God and you will inherit what the Son should have gotten. You see how rich this all is. But I'm going to let you guys play your video games and go outside and ride your bike. Go outside. Stop playing video games. 
have fun. Get off your phones. Because the video is almost over. I could continue to talk for the rest of the day. But I've talked long enough. More tomorrow.